This is Matt Kundal's Hot Air Podcast. This week, I'm going to be reconnecting with my good friend, comedian Sugar Sammy. He and I go all the way back to Montreal in the early part of the millennium. He's truly a citizen of the world, doing comedy in France, in the Middle East, in Quebec, in Canada. And yes, you'll note that I separated those two, and you'll know why as the podcast goes on. It's been nearly 10 years since Sammy has played in Winnipeg, and sadly, I haven't even had a chance to connect with him when he was playing shows in the Middle East or Paris, but I'm glad he's back on the prairies. So it's great to have him over to join me on the podcast on the heels of kicking off his Canadian tour. Yes, the tour starts in Winnipeg. This is all coming together too conveniently. All the dates, by the way, are on the blog or in the show notes of this episode. Go and see him. Sugar Sammy drops by the Hot Air Podcast Studios one fine September day in Winnipeg. It's good. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. Uh, I passed by this place downtown called Clementine's. It's awesome. Yeah, it was packed. We couldn't even go. I have to go like another day because we were in a rush at an interview. 45 minutes later, so I'm like, I'll just rain check it. That place looks like it's packed every day. So... They've got a place at night here. It's also the best restaurant in town called Segovia. Segovia. What do they do? Let me write this down. Spanish tapas. Oh, wow. At night? Yeah. Where is it? Which area? Osborne and Stradbrook. Segovia. What's the best, like, trendy series? Is it still Osborne Village or is that Corden Street still good? I think Osborne's a little trendier. I mean, Winnipeg has, has, uh, has some cool spots. Like, you can't downplay that it's Winnipeg. I know it's Winnipeg. I know internationally no one even knows you exist or cares or uh, people will be like, oh, this is where we'll hi- hide the bombs till we need them. But there are some <laughs> hidden secrets here. There are some cool spots. <laughs> I remember when I came down in 2010, uh, I used to go to this place. Uh, it closed down now, but it was cool. And they used to have uh, on weekdays at the free house, they used to have like cool jazz and funk nights. Okay, so Segovia is like kitty corner to where the free house was. Okay, that's where it is? Yeah. Yeah, that's a cool area. That's that that's a very cool area. And then um, Winnipeg has like, I'll tell you what it is. Winnipeg is like, it's like almost a city, you know? You know what I mean? It like almost matters you know that's what's good about i'm kidding kidding. (laughs) no you're right and a lot of people were afraid that one day it will matter that's why they don't want it to get too big no it's a good hidden secret it's a gem and it's in the middle of the country and if you do business across canada if you're one of those people who flies east and west this is a great place to be and it's not expensive to live here uh, which is cool, and there's not a lot of traffic compared to the big cities, so you're not stuck in traffic for an hour, or traffic for an hour and a half to get anywhere, and you can still have a very decent, cool life here. So there's a lot to be said, but the winters are insane, insane. You know that there are worse places in Canada to have winter. I think Halifax is brutal. I think Montreal's winter is worse than this. You think this win- than this winter here? Yeah. I remember being here in January. I was headlining uh, Rumors. I was here for two weeks, and I was staying at the condo. Rumors has a condo across from this mall. Grant Park Mall. Yeah, I always make fun of that mall. That's a mall where dreams go to die. That- <laughs> <laughs> That's the mall where old people get lost. It's like when you have Alzheimer's, they park you there because so, <laughs> you, won't- <laughs> you won't care where you are. But, like, uh, but, uh, but that that mall was crazy, Grant Park, and then they have the Good Mall. I went to the Good Mall yesterday because they, uh, they, uh, my luggage was delayed, so I had to go buy clothes for my interviews this morning. I went to Polo Park. Now, that's a mall right there, Polo Park. Did you go to Harry Rosen? No, no. I, I, I was, I wasn't sure how much they were going to reimburse me. I went to Hudson's Bay, to Topman. The Topman section is what I'm wearing now. It looks good, man. It's good. It works. It worked for the interviews. How do they lose your luggage between Montreal and Winnipeg? It's one. It's one plane. They didn't lose. I'll tell you what happened. I, I, There's a big lineup because they just delayed everybody's luggage. Uh, so then I went shopping before everything closed and came back to the airport for my luggage claim because it was too long to wait. It was going to be an hour. Um, there were animals in cargo. So when they put animals like cats and dogs, somebody loves their cats and dogs too much, brought them to Winnipeg. And you can't put too much luggage when they're pets in cargo because it'll crush them. 
or I'll suffocate them. So they were like, oh, we have to now wait and your luggage delayed because some cat lady who is <laughs> this lonely postmenopausal woman <laughs> had 22 cats and had to like, and had to bring them all to Winnipeg. I remember when you came to uh, to Winnipeg in, in 2010. I thought it was 2009, but 2010, that, that checks out. It was January, and it was the coldest possible week of winter because that last week of January is always hell on earth. But, man, you and I sat. We wrote some good stuff. Empire Strikes Back references. Oh, my God. It was awesome. It was awesome. I remember we hung out. We went to, I think we, did we go for breakfast or coffee? We went for something. We went to a falafel place. That's it. Yeah. That's right. That was cool. Now, now he's moved, but he's still serving up great breakfast. Oh, where's this guy? He's on Corden. What's it called? Uh, falafel place. Falafel place. I yeah. And it's, uh, you know, Ami, he runs the place and he's, uh, uh, you know, he's been doing it for many, many years in his third location now, but it kicks ass. It was freezing. I remember I was like, oh, okay. They're trying to filter the unemployed out by really making it cold in Winnipeg like in 2010. I'm like, that's it. This is how they get rid of people. Like, all right, let's clean out Winnipeg, make it real cold. It was so cold, I was afraid for people. But we're still here. We're all still here. I know. That's how resilient you guys are as Winnipeggers. But it's not that bad a winter. I'm telling you, Montreal is worse. It is so damp in Montreal. And then you get 40 centimeters of snow. And then you get the, the these snow banks. You can't take your car anywhere. Yeah. In in Montreal. Any like even when there's no snow, you can't take it anywhere. Yeah. But then you've got these snow banks. It takes three days to clear them off and the yeah. orange signs come out and you know, there's a snow removal budget in Montreal of about sixty million dollars. Yeah. In Winnipeg, it's only three. Wow. And then when it runs out, it runs out. We yeah. don't, we're not clearing anymore. Yeah. And we and we we we're legally obliged to clear it all in French. <laughs> <laughs> we can't clear snow in English. You have to do it in French. So there's that as well. Um, no, but Winnipeg's cool. Like I, I was telling my uh, my girlfriend, I said, you know, I like Winnipeg because you actually it's a city where you c- you can actually live in. You know, there's a, a point where a city becomes so big that it's not functional anymore. It's not pleasant to have a life there, you know. We live in Paris half the year. Like, Paris is just too tense. You age in Paris, man. You you actually get older fast in Paris and London, Tokyo, New York. Those are the type of cities, you know, they're not good for you as a human being. You know, they're probably good for business, but you're not going to age well. So what, like, you have to almost like outweigh what what's better for you but you know you have cities like winnipeg montreal still i think uh one of those cities you know ottawa uh you know where where you can actually have a life and and uh and still have uh, the comforts of a big city you know how about alberta have you done any gigs calgary edmonton vancouver yeah, yeah calgary edmonton uh great vancouver's in bc still but uh yeah i've, I've been <laughs> i've been uh i've done calgary edmonton I, I like it as well calgary edmonton i like i like uh, canada in general i always feel safe and good when i'm on home soil you know so it's been nine years since you've been to winnipeg that you and i have seen each other yeah i've done a little bit of traveling but you've done like this shit ton of traveling and you've gone to some of the most remarkable places so first i see you're in dubai how did you get to Dubai and you were doing a string of shows and you went back and forth a lot? So what's the attraction there? Uh, Dubai, I remember that was years ago. I haven't been to Dubai since... Uh, 2013, probably. Even before. I yeah. think once my career took off in Quebec in 2012, I was really there a lot because it was I was doing four to six shows a week for the whole year almost, for like for four and a half years. And then I went to France directly from there. But when I was doing Dubai, it was pretty cool. I got the gigs because um i started getting a following on on youtube I started watching my specials my 2006 comedy now and then they immediately brought me to dubai i filmed uh, a set there on a gala that kicked off and then I, they they booked a tour for me across the middle east uh that did well and then i filmed a special in dubai my own special so i started building a whole following in dubai but then once quebec took off i was just like i couldn't leave quebec this sounds really weird because when you say took off in Quebec, I mean, I met you in 2005. You and I met at Shom, and Terry DeMonte was sick. So I'm like, who's going to do this show with me today? Well, we got Sugar Sammy in today to, to do some stuff. And you had some gigs, so you were going to promo it, and you hung around a little bit. We had a good time. Yeah, it was great. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, and to think you hadn't really taken off then. I've always thought you'd been a star. 
But, oh, wow. you know, you were on the air in 2005, and I remember uh, the listeners began to connect with you, and they started calling the radio station. Hey, I want to talk to Super Sammy. <laughs> yeah, I remember. <laughs> I want to oh. talk to, to, to Super Packy. Yeah, Sugar Packy. Sugar Packy. Sugar Packy, and then Super Packy. And then I remember, like... Uh, I was getting popular, but in the Anglo side of Montreal. But then in 2012, I really, it really took off in terms of all of Quebec. So the Anglos and the Francos uh, started really following me um, later on. You know, I think uh, I, I was like slowly just building my audience, and then uh, with all these appearances, you know, I did a couple sets at Juste pour Rire. I did. Uh, stuff with Pauline Marois on TV. And it was, it was just like that combo of things that just every time I was on TV, I was doing something that was kind of relevant to <clears throat> to Quebec in a certain way and politically charged, you know. So so then once it took off, I was really just filling up theaters because when I remember in 2004, 2005, when I was doing Shom and when Terry put me on uh, as well, it was like I was filling up comedy clubs, um, you know. But then I started selling out theaters later, so that that was a whole different level to the to the to success to the fame. You single out 2012 as being when it really took off. So what happened then? Uh, we just put on that bilingual show on sale, so it united both the Francos and the Anglo's, and then it just sold out um, like crazy. We just put on so many shows, man, and we. I think that show, that bilingual show, I did like 372 thousand tickets. It was crazy, and people said. You're crazy. Don't do it. Yeah, that is that is such a Montreal thing to say. I know. Was it people from Montreal or Toronto who were no, saying? No, no, it was Montreal. It was like, it's such a Canadian thing too to be like, nah, just it's never been done. I'm always like, it's never been done. We should do it. Most people are like, it's never been done. You can't do it. I like saying, well, it's never been done. That's why we should do it. You know, it's always like, be the first. Why be why be the fifth one to do it? Can I ask how old you are? <clears throat> I'm 43 now. Okay. So you're, we're separated by about a generation. I'm, I'm nearly 50. Okay. So you're really a child of Bill 101. That's right. And for anybody who, who's listening to this and doesn't know what that is, I'm going to let you explain it because it's so darn hard to explain. But uh, basically, it forced uh, anybody who really wasn't English or who was going to arrive in Quebec mm -hmm. to become uh, educated in French and to grow up in French. So did you go to school in French? Um I went to school in French. I did my elementary and high school in French and then CJEP and university in English. CJEP, for people who don't know, is uh, in Quebec. It's between high school and university. It's sort of a preparatory program. They kind of park you there uh, until you decide what you want to do. It's kind of like um, the Grant Park Mall of education <laughs> they just <laughs> they just kind of leave you there for a sec so uh so i was in cj i did my siege up in uh, university in english yeah so i pretty much got a complete education in terms of the linguistics and and um and you know having a, a kind of a local regional education and an international one so growing up in quebec you had english friends you had allophone friends you had francophone friends and friends from all walks of life. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's one of the reasons I was so successful at um, stand up, and it worked for me every like you know in internationally is because I'm a product of that. You know that I was able to. I was I was born where I was born. I think that had a huge part in in um, in my success. The fact that I'm able to translate to so many cultures because it's not just a linguistic adaptation; it's a cultural one. Meaning, even my show in Quebec, the French one that I did in Quebec, I couldn't have just transposed it and brought it in word for word to France. I had to write a whole new show about the French in France, about what's going on with them and what makes them tick and what they think about and what they're surrounded by every day. So, And that only happened because from an early age, I have that reflex that was you know, kind of instilled in me by Canadian society of like, get to know someone who's different than you don't push them away you know and i think that's one of the cool things about being canadian is you're able to adapt to pretty much anyone because you've been doing it all your life you know it's a this whole country is made up of people who come from different places different walks of life in different countries and that's what we're doing all the time so it's uh it's one of the advantages we have here as canadians in terms of not only comedy and the arts but business 
in terms of diplomacy, in terms of all kinds of uh, different ways of, uh, uh, you know, uh, in different fields and different um, disciplines, we're, a- we're able to do that. And that's a very Canadian thing. It's cool. One of your uh, best bits that I remember from, you know, before 2009 was, is, you know, involved a Haitian accent. Mm. But you got to be from Montreal to really understand the humor that's involved with that because we hang around in, in, in taxi cabs and predominantly there are a number of Haitians who do it. So a Haitian accent, you can't take that to, to many parts of the world where people are going to understand it right away. Right. Yeah. And not just that. It's like the authentic behavior of a Haitian guy from my neighborhood. And that's what a lot of people like in the Haitian community in Montreal identifies with. And when I go to Haiti, they all so have seen that clip. And I get a huge following when I go to Haiti when they come out because they know that I'm going to do bits about them. And that comes from hanging out with Haitian guys when I was a kid. And we used to just, I used to hang out with them all the time. And I still have like, uh, I'm still in touch with all of my friends from uh, from high school and I still talk to them. So I'm able to have that shorthand, but that only happened naturally. I can't force it. When I go to Toronto, someone's like, ah, you should do a Jamaican thing. I'm like, I don't really know the Jamaicans that well, so I'm not going to do it. I'd rather just focus on the stuff that I know, you know. So uh, I think uh, that's a product of, again, being born where I was. Remember somebody heckled at a show that I saw you last time uh, that you were in Winnipeg, and they uh, they said, hey, crack some Jewish jokes. <laughs> and you said, hey, I'm trying to become employed in Hollywood. Yeah, exactly. I'm in <laughs> entertainment. You guys own everything. There's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of interaction that goes on in, in the shows. So what's the difference between you know the show being interactive and then somebody heckling? And how do, you, how do you control that when the show is going on? It feels like some form of controlled chaos when I see your shows. Yeah, I mean, that just, I think, happened naturally. It was a question of survival. I think as Canadian comics, you work in comedy clubs coming up through the ranks and, you know, you end up hosting as well as opening. And it forces you to do crowd work and control crowds. And you're able to kind of have these reflexes and develop these tools to um, to manage an audience, you know. Um, And I think Canadian comics are better at that than most uh, I think Canadians and Brits, because we're when we're not headlining, we end up hosting a lot as well uh, in, in the comedy club circuit, and it's one of those things that comes with the territory. So you see that a lot. It's a skill I think a lot of Canadian comics have, and I certainly developed it just doing that. And then I, I have fun with it as well. I, I like interacting with the audience. It just it's a it's it's a lot of fun to do. I had a uh, somebody from Quebec on uh, my other podcast, the Sound Off podcast. And I, I try to sort of shed a light to the rest of Canada. Mm. And I, I think you know the divide, and I know the divide between working and living in Quebec versus um, the rest of Canada. Mm-hmm. The ROC, you can almost put it on a map, ROC, rest of Canada. <laughs> uh, but I had Genevieve Bourne uh, come on to the other podcast, and we talked about what it was like to be a star in Quebec. And it's not the same as being a star in Canada and I can't really put my finger on what it is but I know you started working in Quebec and you just sort of stuck with it and you become incredibly famous in Quebec but you're not as famous in Canada Mm -hmm. and I don't think that bothers you in any way but it's just sort of tough to explain to people about why in Quebec when when your star rises it shoots high yeah it goes pretty quick just because it's uh, such an insular society you know and then if you kind of do the rounds the media rounds like you'll do like four or five of the big tv shows and then you know lots of the radio a couple print art articles and you've pretty much everyone has seen you or knows about you now because of that so that's that's how quick it goes whereas it, with canadians you have to you know they consume so much uh such a variety of of stuff they don't just consume canadian uh content they consume so much american content that it's hard as a canadian to to really push through that unless you're doing it in a big way, you know? Um, but I remember before I was doing Quebec, I was really uh, starting to rise on the Canadian side as well. I was doing like big theaters in Canada. I still am. I mean, the rest of this tour is, is pretty much a thousand seats in every market, but it's completely different than Montreal where I did, uh, you know, almost 200,000 tickets for one show. I'm doing like, you know, uh, 2,000 seats in Toronto, 2,000 seats in, in, in Vancouver. I'm doing 2,500 seats in Ottawa because it's so close to Quebec. And everywhere else, pretty much, you know, any, between five and 700 seats. So, yeah, it's like, uh, it's such a insular market. It's so quick to be able to, like, just build yourself if you do the right 
media run, you it, it goes pretty quick. Whereas in Canada, I mean, it's hard to do all of that. You have to like name a major like five major media outlets that every Canadian consumes. That's that are purely Canadian. It's hard, you know. Like, how many people do you know? I was on W Five. They did a half hour report on me last year. And I mean, I don't know how many Canadians watched that, but it wasn't to the extent of the percentage of Quebecers who would have watched that had it been on a Quebec network like Radio Canada would have been insane. It would have been a few million. Whereas here, I think it must have been like 100,000 or something because other people are watching CNN, they're watching MSNBC, they're watching Netflix, they're watching CBS, NBC, they're watching all these networks. So it's all spread out, you know. Who interviewed you at W5? Uh, Geneviève Beauchemin. Okay. She came to Paris to interview me. And yeah. uh, we did Montreal and Paris, you know. I think, yeah, I got more action out of, I mean, it was great. It was such a great profile. It's still online and people watch it and it's, uh, it was great. But like, you know, when I, I made the cover of the New York Times last year, every, like I got so many emails from the States and from, from everywhere around the world. Like internationally, I'd be getting like love and email and emails and facebook messages and you know lots of agents in america called me because i was in the new york times it's like a different degree you know so i think that's the thing is like we haven't promoted canadian culture uh strongly because we're still struggling with our identity as canadians like we haven't figured out and defined a strong identity as canadians yet we haven't like put it down on paper we all we're always vague about it and everyone keeps kind of kind of saying something that's a very gray area but you know if we're able to be if we're able to be strong and proud about it and like say here's who we are as canadians we're proud of it we're sticking by it um and now let's create culture that reflects that i mean that'd be good but i don't know if canadians as canadians will agree on it <laughs> You mentioned that you moved to Paris. So you're telling me that you've moved out of your parents' house? I did move out of my parents' house. I moved out of my parents' house very early for an Indian guy at the age of 37. <laughs> 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 I'm unmarried, mind you. So uh, so it's uh, so I've now been... Uh, and nobody's tried to arrange that? Nobody's tried to... I, I have a... You know what? I th- at this point, my parents, I remember in my 20s, wanted to arrange a marriage for me with an Indian woman and they really wanted like a Punjabi Indian. And like in the, in, in my thirties, they were like, okay, um, just find, uh, um, just find an Indian woman. doesn't matter if she's Punjabi. And now in my forties, they're like, just find a woman. It'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, but now I have a lady, we've been together for six years, you know, been together for six years. Really cool. Where'd you meet her? We met through friends. We met through friends. We were always like in the same circles, but like, you know, in what city? Uh, Montreal. And then, um, and then uh, we were never single at the same time. And then we ended up being single at the same time. Uh, hung out once, and that was it. You do stand up in four different languages. Yeah. What are they? English, French, English, French, Hindi, Punjabi. Wow. Yeah. And in fr- let me in a little bit about the about the France thing because I see some video that comes out of France and it makes me howl. Mm. It's 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 tough to explain. It's tough for me to actually understand, you know, what the French are all about. Because in this one clip that I saw on YouTube, you were on a TV show and <laughs> you, you basically put the French in their place and say, you guys are always busy judging. Yeah. And, you know, toujours les, avec les bois, uh, bras croisés, yeah, always right. with the folded arms. Yeah. Look at all three of you. Yeah. I thought that was just so And then funny. they panned out and all three journalists had their <laughs> arms crossed and they were kind of <laughs> looking at me. I was like, look at your body language now. Do they even know who they are? They they do. And, that, and they have a good sense of humor about themselves. I think this is the difference between Quebec and France. When I roast the French, they actually laugh and go, he's right. It's so true. When I roast the Quebecois, they're like, who does he think he is? This isn't true. We're not like that. This is wrong. He's an anti-Quebecer. He uh, hates Quebec and he's shitting on Quebec. And I'm like, no, this is not what I'm doing. I'm actually identifying some of the problems. This is what my, 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 my job is as a comedian. You kind of look at a society, go, okay, here are the kinks, here are the flaws. Now I'm going to make fun of them and just kind of identify them. But that's pretty much it. So I've been doing that a lot. And that's kind of my comedy. You know, it's like a cultural roast. And, you know, I mean, Quebecers got, got mad at me when I went to France. Like, so what are, you, what are you doing over there? Are you making fun of us? 
in France too? And I was like, they don't know who you are. They don't need you. <laughs> don't worry. I'm, I'm busy roasting the French. They don't want to know what's going on in Quebec. Like that's the thing is like, I always kind of make it about the audience in front of me and, and very rarely do something behind their backs. You know, Avery and I are going to go see your show for the first time. There's not enough stuff of you online to really sort of consume the whole show outside of what you mentioned that, that goes back a little bit. Yeah. So we're really excited to, to see you together for the first time. I took her to Montreal. She loves Montreal. We love it so much. Uh, we eat at every restaurant there. But you put the billboards up in 2014. And I had to, and she's from Winnipeg. And I had to explain to her exactly what you were doing. And I felt like it was complicated. Yeah. But when you're in Quebec, we know exactly what you were doing. And right. you, you, you put up these metro signs, basically goading the Office de la Langue Française to, to go ahead, find me, sue me. Let's, we're putting on a show here. Yeah. Uh, did you get the result you wanted? Yeah, it was perfect. I mean, <laughs> I, I pretty much put a sign in English saying, because you're not allowed to put signs in English, you get a, a complaint, you get a, a, a fine. So I said, <laughs> for Christmas, I'd like a fine from the Office de la Langue Française. So it's basically, there's so many layers to that joke where like, I'm telling them I want it. I'm doing it in English. They know I want it. They know there's a purpose. They know I'm looking for trouble. So it gives them a dilemma. So I was like, this is funny. The dilemma will be hilarious because they'll think, if we give it to him, he, that's what he wants. <laughs> so what do we do? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I got the complaint and then uh, automatically just kind of turned that into a big media circus. And it was crazy. It was pretty cool. It was uh, it was all over the world. I think I was, I made front page of The Guardian also in uh or, or I was in The Guardian in England. It was pretty good. Okay, so we know how the government reacted. How did the media react? Did you get two levels of media where, where you know, we understand you, Sammy, ha, ha, ha. And was there the other sort of half that, that you know, calls you out? And Yeah. I mean, there was there were definitely, like, uh, it was split. Like, uh, there, there was, uh, you know, the media that wasn't, uh, you know, sovereignist-based or wasn't, like, uh, you know, <laughs> was didn't have... Uh, any partisan uh, agendas were, were were very cool about it. They th they thought it was a, a very good uh, ad, a very good campaign, very smart. So that was great. And then they had um, sort of like that heavier uh, media and the uh, you know the columnists who who went back on their you know who went back to to to, to ranting and raving about how it was uh, how it was. Uh, against the francophones and against Quebec culture and I was an anti-Quebecois and all that other usual jazz that they'll put out there whenever they're not uh, when they don't agree with your point of view you know what's going on there now because I try to follow along in the news because right. it seemed like growing up that there was you know it was all about getting the English off the signs then they got the English off the signs then it was telling us all where to go to school then we all went to school yeah. and now it seems to be they're they're telling us what religious symbols we can wear is that is that a good sort of accurate summary of the last 30 years in Quebec yeah kind of i mean i think there's so much i think it's not about language that's what you realize the more it goes it's more about you need to know your place as people who have who are guests here in our home that's pretty much what it is. It's not. This is our home together. This is. It's. That's not what it is. It's not. This is our home and your home. This is. This is what it is. It's our home. We decide how it's going to go, and you follow, and you have no say in this. This is your guest. Do you understand? Yeah. That's what it is. That's basically what it is. If you really peel it back, that's what that is. And you better be lucky here. And I, I even talk about it in my new Quebec show, which is coming out next year. I'm like, yeah, we're guests in your home. Let's ask the natives what they think about that. <laughs> you know? And then I just go on about it. So it's like, uh, basically, that's what it is. And everything, every little adjustment to a law, every new proposed charter, every new proposed bill that sort of goes into that is designed for you to know your place. But the food in Montreal is just oh, holy phenomenal. The thing with racism is it tastes so good. <laughs> <laughs> it tastes great. You ever eat food in places oh. where there are no races? There's no races. You had to eat food in Ottawa. 
Ew. Uh, racist food is the best. <laughs> you got some favorite Montreal restaurants? Um, I have a bunch, man. There's so many good restaurants. Or you don't have to mention any if you think you might leave one out and offend somebody. No, that's I think, I, look, if I if I did forget, uh, let me know. But I, I love, uh, there's so much good stuff going on in Montreal uh, in terms of cuisine. Uh, look, I, I love, there's a breakfast place in my area now called uh, Café Orange. I love that place. It's on uh, the Carry and NDG, I think. Correct. Yeah, so good. The portions are amazing. And but I also go there for the company. The owners, uh, Jimmy and Georgia, are amazing. Jimmy, you could talk to. I come up with ten minutes of new material every time I leave that restaurant. You just sit down with him in front of him at the booth, in the booth, and he he come up with so much material just because he has such strong opinions about society. That's where I used to live. I used to live on North Cliff, right around the corner. Oh, from it's there. right there. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. So I, I used to go there. Yeah. Uh, way back when, but yeah, I know exactly where it is. Yeah. Where and you? That, wh- and that Monkland area is just taken off, man. It's so great. Monkland, the whole NDG area, that whole Sherbrooke, it's beautiful. And the NDG, even uh, when you go a little bit more west. Uh, La Louisiane and all those cool places. We were talking about Cosmo. It's Cosmos not too long ago. Um, they also have uh, downtown these new places called, there's Biru, which is really cool, Izakaya, and this other one in old Montreal, Hanzo, which is like a like a, a heightened version of, of Biru. And then there's a, a new restaurant place, best Mexican place in Montreal called Escondite. Try it next time you're there. It's in the Cartier Spectac. Cartier Spectac's bringing in a lot of new stuff, a lot of cool new uh, restaurants. I'm going to Montreal in November for a uh, for a comedy show. Sebastian Maniscalco. Mm. Man, is he killing it or what? He is. Like he said, I think he f- he's filled up the Bell Center. I think there's like uh, thirteen thousand, fourteen thousand seats. He's he's gonna kill it there, man. Yeah, I'm going in for that, and you know I don't get my. Uh, Nobody tells me what to watch because I'm nearly 50. Mm. It gets shown to me through the girlfriend who yeah. show, says, this is funny. We're watching. Yeah. And so I became a fan. Oh, he's great. And the next night there's a Habs game. Oh, look at you. I know. You're going to have a great time in Montreal. They're playing the Devils the next night. Pete, oh, wow. Subban. Subban's coming back. Wow. So that's going to be a fun night, fun a weekend for you. I got a big weekend. And then maybe maybe I'll go to like Joe Beef or something on Thursday and Amazing. come back broke. Yeah, but happy. Oh, so man, happy, man! Just <sighs> spending racist money <laughs> and, and having a great time. <laughs> Here to eat your food. The racist economy. Ah, oh. <laughs> come for the food. Leave because of the racism. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about about you know you mentioned YouTube and you mentioned all this stuff coming up, but you know your content. I mean, you 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 make the comedy stuff. And then how do you sort of control all the content that gets made? Uh, well, I mean, everything that's out there, I usually pretty much control. So we just put out uh, improv moments because that way we're not burning material. So I just put out, because I do a lot of improv, so it, use, I, you know, it serves me as not only a tool because I love um, doing it, but it's also great promotional material because it's a unique moment that will never happen again. So... Um, it's not like people are coming to the audience like, oh, I know all this stuff. I've seen it online. So when they come to the show, it's all fresh. It's all new. So I only put out old stuff, old specials that I've, you know, that I don't usually, you know, use material from anymore. So I just put that out and uh, and crowd work. Yeah. And like even the old specials, I'm like, oh, I look at them now. I'm like, I can't put this out. It's not as good as now. You know, like stuff that's 10 years old, 15 years old, I try to keep offline. Because I'm like, oh, I'm way better than that. And like, I don't want people to judge my material on that. Do you have any material you say, we couldn't put this out today because times have changed and people are too sensitive about N- stuff? Or? No, I actually, now if you come to my show, it's edgier than ever, you know? So I kind of, I'm like going against the grain. I'm like, I want to be at the, the other side of the, you know, of the pendulum swinging. And I, I kind of just go full on, you know, I kind of say exactly what everybody says when no one's around because I don't really have a job to lose. You know, it's not like I'll have an opinion and all of a sudden I'm, I don't have a TV show anymore, a radio show. It's like, it's all stand up. I control everything I do. So it's like the fun part about that is it's like, it's my material. It's my opinion. It's what I, I want to say. And I want to put out there, you know? So, you know, I, I still do what I really want to do. And, and crowds, audiences find that refreshing. They come to the show and they're like, man, finally someone who 
actually says this, you know? So I'm like, oh, perfect. Well, because we're not allowed to laugh about that stuff at the office anymore. No, you're not allowed to laugh about that stuff anywhere. anywhere. On social media, forget it. You know, you can't even... That's why I'm like, I just like, come to the club, come to the show, you'll have a great time. People, people actually come up to me and go, oh, we loved it. Because you don't hear that anymore. You don't see that kind of comedy. I mean, you know, um, I think good comedy is always uh where you really show your flaws and you show you don't show the perfect being you're supposed to be you show the flawed and imperfect person that you really are you know the kind of opinions that you really have like i make fun of my girlfriend all the time now like you know we've been together for six years and she's my muse and in most art forms that's a compliment in comedy it's not you know it's like she's my but people are like you can't make fun of women i'm like uh yes i can uh, uh, I'm doing it and you're going to come to my show and you're going to see it and I why do you think I got a girlfriend <laughs> this is six years of material well I can't wait to meet your girlfriend vicariously through your comedy yeah well you'll meet her she's here actually this weekend really so you will meet her yeah that's awesome yeah yeah it's going to be perfect so she's flying in or she's with me she's with me she, we work together so she, you know all the improv moments that are online she films them edits them puts them online really yeah she does all that that is awesome yeah so we're always together. Well, she's killing your social media, man. It's awesome stuff. She's awesome. Yeah, she's great. So she and this guy, Pascal, who's a good friend now, they both they both work uh, my social media together. And, um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been cool. It's been cool not only for material. And she's the first one I try material on. I always bounce stuff off of her. And she likes it when I go edgy. She's a perfect comedian's wife. She just loves it. She just loves uh, help, helping me out. And she has a great eye and, and ear for it, you know? Well, I'm excited to meet her. That's great. Yeah. It's good. Six years, man. Six years. I mean, you know, you and I have the same birthday, right? 29th? Oh, you're the 29th. I'm the 28th. That's fine. 28th is good, too. But you have to celebrate th on the 28th, three years out of every four. Yeah. We say 29th. It's like 29th of February, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, leap day, man. What's that like? I mean, did you, you must have known that you were weird from the start then, right? It's good. You're special without doing anything. You know, cool. What most millennials want want to be right now is they just want to be special without doing anything. So I had that millennial feel to me. Right, right. I talk about millennials a lot too. This is great. It's funny. You feel, I feel old talking about the millennials. I feel like these kids today, millennials. I think we peg them. You know, nineteen years old all the way up to I guess thirty five, thirty six year old. I think that's too old to identify them as millennials. I think millennials. We need to like create subcategories because nineteen to like twenty two, twenty three is a whole different person than the thirty five year old. Okay, that's Gen Z, and you know, you met my my son upstairs. He's eighteen. Yeah, I got the twins who are twenty. Yeah, and they're Gen Z. I mean. These are the ones. Millennials are like, yeah, I might listen to the radio once in a while. It's not cool. Uh -huh. Gen Z don't even know what the radio is. No, and they want they want applause for just existing. You didn't. I, I'm. You know, my son is very pissed off. You didn't clap. Yeah, As I was, when, he when, actually he actually seems balanced. Oh compared no, compared to he, most of them. Oh my God, he is not balanced at all. No, upstairs he's probably watching Fox News right now. Yeah, with his Trump hat on. Yeah, um, and he, you know, he he hates universities. For and he asked me to ask you this question as well, and that, and that's you know because you did do universities for a time. So yeah. what is it like being a comedian and having to work on a campus or at a campus, and and do you just avoid it now, or um, what's what, what's what's the temperature like out there? I don't know if I'd avoid it. I'd do it. I don't. I think they'd avoid me. I I don't. I don't think it's it's. Uh, I'm not afraid of that. I'd rather just go and face the the music and and just be like, listen, here's what I think. You know, and be like, I know that you're going to go and cry about this <laughs> and you're going to be mad. But here's what I believe. And here's my material. And you don't have to walk away with this. Be offended. Thing is, I don't think everybody's offended today. I think everybody likes to pretend to be offended because they like the attention you get by acting like you're offended. Because listen, if you look at it realistically, you have 200 t uh, TV channels today. You have millions of websites you could go on. You have so many streaming platforms. You have Spotify. You have all kinds of things you could do. It's not required viewing to watch my special. It's not re required listening to listen to my CD. But if you're actively listening to it and then actively writing a blog about it, it's because you want the attention. 
Because if I don't like something, I'll switch. I'll be like, ah, it's not for me. I don't really like it. I was bored or eh, I was just too aggressive. I'll go watch something else. So I don't, I actually think these people who pretend that they're offended aren't really offended. They're just, they just want the pat on the back and they want to start their, everybody wants to start their own little movement, you know, on Twitter and on Facebook for that Tuesday afternoon, go get the likes and the retweets. That's what they're looking for. It's almost like your, uh, your show is a safe space. My show is a safe space to make rape jokes. No, I'm kidding. It's <laughs> <laughs> now, it is a safe space to, ma- to, to joke about. Like some, that's the thing is comedians are, comedians are the first ones to say and joke about the most horrible things in the world. We're supposed to do that. That's traditionally what comedians do. That's what we've been doing for decades. We've been doing for half a century. You know, if you look at some of the big names, without comparing myself to any of these people, but the Lenny Brewsters of the world, the Richard Pryors of the world, the Dave Chappelle's of the world, like they all, the George Carlin's of the world, that's what they did. They went, they looked at these horrible things and made light of them through comedy. And that's what we're supposed to do. Would you ever consider... Uh, getting a podcast I would it's just too time consuming yeah they, they take up a fuck of a lot of time yeah and I'm always on the road so it's kind of tough I'd have to kind of do it I'd have to figure out a way to do it where um, it would survive without guests all the time it, it need to have like I'd have to figure out the format that could work like it's either me solo me with guests taking in phone calls uh, reading fan mail, like all that stuff, so I could do it from anywhere, anytime. You know? Yeah, they are a hell of a lot of work. Um, just as somebody who's sort of in charge of nine of them, yeah, it's it's pretty insane stuff. And the first thing I remember is, you know, sat down, microphone, spent eight hours working on it, and I came up with eleven minutes of material. Wow! And I was like, oh my god, this is this is not the midday show at Shome, and no disrespect to Tutal and the work that he was doing at Shome doing mm-hmm. the midday show, but you know, you get your traffic and your weather and your commercials and everything else that sort of fills up the hour. And here it's just a couple microphones and you and me talking. Yeah. No, you gotta. You, I, I guess you gotta figure out a direction for it sometimes too. You gotta just go, okay, what what's our direction? What do I want to talk about? What's the exact info I need to bring out there? Or kind of uh you know what niche do i want to go and serve and it's also like you have to be passionate about it i mean i've been thinking about doing a podcast that's like non-comedy related as well but uh but i'm like because i'm passionate about it i'm like i'd love to do something about the 80s yeah you know because it's like it's like just a decade that i love there's so much material there and it'd be fun to just have that and have like a couple discussions and even some really cool celebrity guests from the 80s you know like just people who were like like can't wait for someone to interview them because it's been so long you know like, <laughs> like you know just sass jordan yo oh, <laughs> what's I, going on <laughs> do you have any sass jordan memories no i, I she was in the box that's why i thought because we were talking about the box before yeah she's saying uh, she's saying back up and i was thinking of, actually the other day of of and i'll tell you it goes back to genevieve born because the first time i met her um was at uh, it was Steve Miller Band, Brian Adams, Sass Jordan, and I think the Black Crows were wow. down were down on on Nuns Island doing a show. And I said, "Oh my God, I forgot about Sass Jordan in that 1992 album um, that she had." And it's like, hmm, brings back a memory. Yeah, it was it was that was a big album in Canada, wasn't it? Yeah, she had an album in '88, and it had a song called "Tell Somebody." Yeah. See, that, that's that's a good idea. We just bring that back. Yeah, on your podcast. Talking yeah. and bring and Sass Jordan's going to join us this week. Man, I like this idea. Awesome. We're gonna we're gonna take this podcast idea somewhere. Tell somebody what was that song about? I don't know. I was like, if if any of those kids who hung out with Michael Jackson just listened to that song, <laughs> life would have been different. <laughs> <laughs> Tell somebody, child. <laughs> I just I just got back from a podcast convention, and it was actually one of the things that I, that I didn't see. At the convention, because now it's you know it's a little bit more business type, but I didn't see a lot of comedians, and I didn't see a lot of you know the people who do the political podcasts. I all thought, right. you know, and I see there's like podcasts coming out all the time from comedians, and they love it because they try out their material in there, and they can yeah. try it out with their friends, and they can just you know 
put it out there and whatnot. And you know, comedians have done very well at it, but I didn't see any at the convention. Is it? Is it? Um, is it? Uh, is it like uh, one of those things? I feel like too many people are doing podcasts. Yes, like it's almost getting to the point where there are too many, and eventually the best will survive, and then the rest will just kind of fade out. But I feel like uh, that's why it, I don't want to just put one out to put one out it'd have to be there would have to be some sort of thinking behind it and a format that i could follow um and i almost think now it'd be fun to do shorter podcasts too you know like uh two or three minutes long no two three two three minutes is like an ad <laughs> <laughs> that'd be like an ad i'd be like you know like uh, 20 minutes yeah 20 25 minutes you know um I think that would be fun. Do you have any that you listen to when you travel or? I don't really listen to. You know what I've been listening to lately, just because I was a guest on it, was Les Taber Slackers, Brendan Kelly's yep. uh, podcast. Have you heard that? It's I have not heard it yet, but I, I saw it popped up on my uh, new and noteworthy at one point and then into my, you. if you like this podcast, you definitely love this podcast. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah, no, it was pretty cool. It was good because I, I like that. Um, the fact that they're interviewing bilingual, uh, uh, you know, people in Montreal, bilingual uh, um, celebrities in Montreal, because it's it kind of gives you a feeling of what's going on, you know, in the in the city on both sides of the culture. But like people were kind of divided right in the middle. What is going on in Montreal? Well, look, there's a whole lot going on. I mean, it's the same old. Like we were talking about it before, but uh, but. There's a whole... Because um, I know we talked about Quebec, but Montreal, it, it's... First of all, it seems completely under construction. Yeah, it's they're never going to finish it. No. Um, it's gotten worse. Especially in your part of town. Oh, everywhere. It's gotten worse. It's hard to get home. It's... And... and, and uh, By the way, it was the first week of school last week. You got about 800 schools in the part of town where you live in and nobody can get anywhere. No. And it's like the mayor's playing a new game with us called, you're not going to leave the house. <laughs> 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 and if you do, uh, if you, and you're certainly not taking that car. No, yeah, you're not going to leave the house. And if you do leave the house, you're not getting back home today. Like you're not going to leave. The house. You don't think you're going to leave the house and come back home in the same day, do you? <laughs> That's not going to happen. Um, but I, th- I think we made a mistake. I think Montreal has made a mistake by getting rid of Denis Kada. I think they jumped on a movement that was. Uh, uh, that was just misinformed about uh, how it all works. How it all works because he is the best mayor we've had in a long, long time. And you realize that when uh, the new mayor came in, like you realize how great this guy was by by the fact that we lost this guy. I mean, uh, I think I think I don't think he'd have trouble winning the election if he came back because everybody just used formula e against him but you know it was gutsy of him to try it formula e to try to like bring it to montreal and like most businesses you lose money on it the first year but then Mm -hmm. you make it back a few years later if it keeps going and they just kind of used it as a political tool against him one failure out of how many successes and you know just keeping this the, the the city running garbage being picked up uh snow being picked up uh, and you being able to uh, leave the house, those three basic things aren't working right now. And like, if the basic services aren't being done, someone's not doing their job. Went to, I think I went out for dinner, and then I took the car, went over the mountain, and then got turned around because they closed the mountain of the car. So I go, what is this fuckery? Yeah. Honest to God. Look, she blocked the one last street that was working. You said, I'm no, we're not doing this. You think you're going to drive? Get out of here. And that's the thing is like she she got elected because of the Formula E thing. And then everybody also said, oh, she's going to be the first female mayor of Montreal. And then when she won, everybody's like, oh, the first female mayor in Montreal's history. I'm like, yes, also the worst mayor in the history of the world, you know? To the point where even like <laughs> people in Hiroshima are like, that's awful. <sighs> that's a, that that city is in trouble. And how much time a year you spend in Paris? I spend uh, almost six months a year. And when I come home, every time I come home, I feel like it's getting worse. Montreal's getting worse and worse in terms of 
just a functional city. It's not functioning anymore. Do you go to Barcelona ever or Madrid or Spain or? I haven't gone to Spain yet. It's one of the countries I need to go to. Okay, you need to go there. Um, London? London, yeah. Must, you must love it. I love London. I love London. Actually, you know what? Uh, I think my next, uh, one of my next targets in terms of, uh, in terms of comedy is going to be uh, London and England. I, I definitely want to go to the UK. I feel like there's such a great space there for me to to take on. Oh, my goodness. As it, an Indian guy, first of all, in England, because there's such a big population. And uh, from North America, I think there's such a good perspective to have there. I actually made fun of them about Brexit. We can start the the comedy writing process now, you and me. Let's do it. Just just with, with England. It is just ripe for the pickings. Oh. No, you, you could go conquer that thing. I think so. Especially now they're weak. <laughs> it's oh time to, it's time to it's time to take over. Oh, that Brexit thing? That Brexit thing. That thing's crazy. a midlife crisis. It's insane, man. <clears throat> Brexit and then What's his name? Boris that um, Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson. Boy, Brexit. he looks clumsy. He looks like Trump, but like twenty years older and drunker and fatter. Drunker, yeah, Tr- yeah. It's like Trump at the pub. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start that. So if you were going to start the writing process and you say, okay, I'm going to take this to London, uh-huh. um, and what's the white writing process going to be? You and I will sit here. We'll, we'll come up with a whole bunch of jokes and yeah. we'll, we'll write this stuff. But what is a writing process like for? Uh, you know, you're going to tell your, your girlfriend, okay, this is going to be the writing zone. How long is that going to be? What's your day like? And what's the plan of attack? I have to move there. Yeah. I'd have to go there. And then um, right away, as soon as I land, the first thing, because the differences pop out right away when, you, when you're when you not from there and you haven't been there in a while. And just start writing everything. And then start trying it out on people. And then it's all trial and error taking it to open mics, kind of feeling it out. Also sitting down with locals, asking them questions. Hey, this is what I've noticed. What do you think of this? And then they'll tell you, oh, well, this happens because... So it'll be like, Brexit, you guys really into it? You know, and they'll be like, nah, that's really not a big city thing. Most people in big cities are ashamed of it. I didn't know that. It's like more a rural thing. Like rural England is really where that originated from everybody in the big cities is almost ashamed that this is a thing internationally it's a it's a it's a, a big like uh, shameful thing to, to most young uh diverse uh brits you gotta feel a britain anyways because i remember some of your old material you talked about the brits they're just so drunk all the time it's true they they drink so much yeah they it, I, i've never seen that level it's almost like they're trying to have Guinness come down and say, we need to have a section in the book for how much you guys drink. (laughs) 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 Like there's gotta be a drinking Guinness book of records. They're, they're bad at it. They're crazy because I almost understand it too. They, um, they, they, uh, they drink every day and it's almost a sport and it's environmental, right? Because I remember when I was there, uh, and I don't really drink. I only drink very rarely. Uh, whenever like someone would want to buy me a drink, and I'd be like, "Oh yeah, I'll just have a diet coke," they'd lose it. It would be like diet coke, really, and then they'd like go gather other Brits to like form a circle around you, a circle of shape diet coke, and then like you gonna drink a diet coke? I'm like, yeah. I thought you know, it's Tuesday morning (laughs) i'd take it a little bit easy (laughs) um so uh so yeah so it's it's kind of like culture a cultural thing over there yeah i was mentioning barcelona because i've been a few times and uh, so uh girlfriend avery and i we got back from bilbao we took the train in got to barcelona and i promised her lunch in in you know in the town square and we got into the town square and you could hear this noise and it was like this rabble or it sounded kind of like a riot. It was, it was like, and it's only noon. No, it's, it's actually one o'clock, two o'clock maybe with, with, that's when they have lunch in Spain and it is loud. And it was Manchester United fans who were there for the UEFA cup or something. And it was a drunken mess at mm. two in the afternoon. I was like, oh, these fucking people. 
And and when I mean these fucking people, I really just mean football fans. Yeah. And I don't necessarily mean Manchester United. It could be Liverpool. It could be anything. All of them. Yeah, all of them. And they were there to play Barcelona. And I've never cheered for Barcelona so hard in my life. (laughs) Because you just don't want (laughs) those people out on the street Uh, celebrating. We were leaving the next day and they were all hung over at the airport. And they looked like the saddest sack of of drunk needing a drink at that hour. I'll tell you, I, I, I realize why they drink. I might use this on stage is because they're not pretty people no so they need to get drunk to have sex with each other because they wouldn't have it sober <laughs> and clearly no dental plans yeah yeah it's like and i want to leave this one night stand drunk so i don't have to like realize what i just had sex with <laughs> could you imagine being in a worse now. being in a worse situation and watching a british porn oh my god in high definition yeah, with the British accent. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that exact. I gotta got check. I gotta check that out. There's. I don't think there's a big, big industry. Is there for British porn? There is no industry for that. I promise you. <laughs> there's some guy who has a fetish <laughs> who wants to hear someone moan <laughs> with the British accent. So, how many months would you have to be in 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 London or anywhere in England to to come up with with enough material to execute the show? And do you have two or three practice shows beforehand? And I'd have to do a bunch. I'd have to just be there and be up on stage every night, like go to open mics and really just test it out. Is that a is that a two year commitment? Um, I think the building process would be at least a year, but to really be there for a year and then slowly build the show to the point where I'm like, okay, I got it. Do you see now that you've got the social media thing going, you're controlling your content, you're putting it out effectively, that there's going to be any sort of change where you wouldn't go to London or you wouldn't go and want to conquer another part of the earth? Um, No, I'd want to go. It's just most it's mostly also for the passion I have of going to another place and going from being a relatively unknown person. To building it to something, I love uh. doing that. I love it. I love. I love doing it in France. I love doing it in Quebec. I want to do it again in Canada. I, th- I want to rebuild whatever the foundation that I already have because I, I have a good fan base in Canada. But I know I could build upon it, and I think it, it'd be wise for me to do that in England as well, and and in the states eventually. I think those are my markets. That that is fascinating. Yeah. I like that. I like being like. I like showing up at a place, going. No one knows me but this is going to change in two years and here's my plan and here's, I'm going to do it. And I know I'm going to do it. Wow. Where does that come from? I don't know. I've never known anybody who sort of thinks that way. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I just always feel like, it's because it's a building thing. It's a building thing. And nobody wants to, I mean, nobody wants to build something up and then go, that's it. Okay, done with this. And I'm going to go and, and abandon this. Yeah. Or maybe maintain this in some way and then go build another one. Yeah. It's a fascination of building audience. Yeah. And then not just that, it's like also keeps me, I think, humble. Like, you know, just going back and being anonymous again, not being known again, no one caring again, and trying to build my audience one member, like one person at a time democratically, you know? And um, I think it also keeps me, keeps the fire going. It doesn't uh, make me lazy, you know, doesn't make me complacent in any way. Because it's easy once you've had like a a crazy success to go, well, I already have this fan base and I'll just live here where everyone knows me and live that celebrity lifestyle. Well, that's what radio people do. Well, it depends also. I I think I have the luxury of of moving somewhere and doing it. Because I think with radio people, it's also Catch-22 because no one will hire you as an unknown you've worked so hard to get up there you know and no one's going to say well yeah go to england for four years and your job will still be here when you get back you know whereas i know as a comedian i'm in charge of my work so i could leave i could go to france for three years come back and build a new show for quebec which i'm already starting to build when i'm ready and when i'm passionate and come back and go okay uh, i have a new show coming up and my fans will go, yeah, we were waiting for it, and we can't wait to see the new stuff. But, you know, in radio, you can't just go to your boss. Listen, I'm going to go work uh, at this station uh, somewhere else, try to see if I can build a following. I'll be back in a couple of years, but people will still be waiting. Be like, no, we've moved on. we got another morning guy, and people love him now. And- That's why radio people never go on vacation. Yeah. It's a, it's a what is it? Yeah, because they know that. If some new kid comes in <laughs> and is awesome and builds a following in a week, it's like you come back, ah, sorry, man, the ratings went up. I was once that new kid. That was pretty cool. Sorry? Somebody went on vacation and I took over their show. Jeez. I know. 
Jeez, oh, and where's that? Is that person still working? Hopefully, I don't know where they went. <laughs> <laughs> You're cruel. <laughs> That's cruel. Uh, you went to McGill. I didn't know you went to school with Jesse Brown. I did go with Jesse Brown until yeah. until I heard the podcast that you did with Jesse Brown about four years ago. You were on his podcast, his wildly successful Canada Land. Yeah, he kind of he broke that Gian Gameshi thing. Yeah, yeah, he like pushed and and got that done. And his uh, it was impressive. I was like, I remember, I'm like, this guy was in my classes. You know, this guy was in, at my school. And then um, no, it's, it's fun to see people you've been working with. Uh, that you were studying with who actually like uh, are able to make great names for themselves and he's he's impressive and um and uh i know there's another guy who i went to high school with who moved to atlanta and became a newscaster in atlanta and then now i think is in orlando but like you know he he got american work and you know who i went to mcgill with as well is uh, omar sachadina Oh yeah, he's a reporter. Yeah, for CTV. CTV. He was the anchor. Sometimes he's the anchor, and sometimes he's a reporter. But he's uh, he's built himself such a great uh, uh, career as well, and it's fun to see that. It's fun to see that uh, you know, it's great. Yeah, I went to school with Todd Battis from yeah. CTV Halifax, which is why you met, when you mentioned W five, I thought you know if you he might have been one of the ones who was contributing to that story, but then I forgot it was um, Geneviève Beauchemin. Thank you, uh, who did that. Um. Yeah, it's amazing the people that you go to school with, and all of a sudden, it sort of loops around and say, like, "Oh yeah, I went to school with that." Oh, you know who I went to school with in in high school mm. in Ottawa it was Matthew Perry. Oh wow! Yeah, and he we played on the same hockey team. Wow, was he good? No, <laughs> we, I, we were both terrible. <laughs> Actually, was he a nice guy? Great guy. Oh, okay, great guy, outgoing, great actor, of course, naturally. And the, yeah. but he moved to uh, he moved to L.A. to play tennis. And then realized he sucked at tennis and then went into acting and did, wow. did very well for himself. Oh, well, that's good. Thank God he went into acting. Yeah. yeah. He was my favorite one on uh, on Friends. You watched that show? I, I used to watch it. Yeah. I can't watch it now. But, you know, it was easy watching back then. But, like, you realize, like, the stuff that I, th- I don't think Friends would get greenlit today. No, I test it with the kids upstairs. Yeah. And Seinfeld works. Yeah. Simpsons works. Friends doesn't work. Yeah. Because the writing's... Like now that you realize, it's not that great. The the appeal of that was six almost beautiful people in living in 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 the same building, you know. And it was kind of like being friends. So everybody like kind of identified, you know. They went to get that Generation X, Generation Y uh, audience, and everybody identified with one or the other of the characters. It was like a romantic comedy. It was basically like a romantic comedy as a TV series. Yeah, it wouldn't work today. I mean, people still kind of watch it, but Seinfeld is still great, you know. And uh, Curb is awesome. I love Curb Your Enthusiasm. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I still think one of the best scenes in television were the two survivors at the table on Curb Your Enthusiasm, where one guy was who had just come off the TV show Survivor, started arguing with the guy who survived the Holocaust. <laughs> That's so good they're talking about. This. I'm a survivor. No, I'm a survivor. <laughs> we went three weeks with no flip-flops. <laughs> flip-flops! <ha! laughs> I love that. I love Larry David's writing, man. It's so je- I'm so jealous of, of how good he is. I sort of marvel, and this is why I asked you a little bit about writing, because you know, I used to hire people for radio, and I know you're only going to talk for a minute, you're going to talk for two minutes, but if you can't write... I can't hire you to be on the radio yeah. and you write and you know, for podcasts, I've got all these scripts sitting around here and I was actually a little bit embarrassed. I've got papers generally all over the place, but when I do a podcast, not the interview one that we're doing here, but most other ones, I script them out right. and then I read them conversationally. Yeah. Uh, and I know that's some people think that's a little bit weird, but I write it and then I perform it yeah. and then it goes out. Yeah. And these are just interview type podcasts. But if you can't write, it's going to be very, very difficult for you on any stage. I agree with that. <clears throat> I definitely agree with that because I feel like uh, people more than, you know, wanting to see faces actually want to hear voices. They want to know what your point of view is. They want to know where you stand. They want to see something that they're surprised by also. That's why I feel like this political correctness thing is just going to hurt the uh, the arts because the cool thing is, seeing someone with a different point of view than you do is hearing someone who's thinking outside of the box and see what they want to say. I remember <clears throat> when I was uh, on the social, it was great. I I, uh, I did this uh, 
interview you know the social it's like uh it's on ctv at one o'clock one o'clock yeah. yeah that's when i know that i that there's nothing on tv and i got nothing to do <laughs> but it's fun to be there in the middle of like four women and they were thinking they were talking about like something like justin bieber getting married at his age and like do you think um it's okay for people to get married at such a young age and i said and i knew this was gonna have people go what i said I don't think uh, marriage should be allowed until divorce is illegal. And then you could, what? And then I heard backstage people in the green room, like the makeup artists and everybody, the producer, were like, what did he say? And ran to the TV screen, like, <laughs> what is he saying? And then I explained, my, to my, I explained, explained myself, I said, look, I get people getting divorced when there's extreme circumstances, but you cannot get divorced anymore because of irreconcilable differences. You got to work it out as adults. People don't want to go through the pain of, you know, of having the bad times. The thing is, when you get married, you agree to the good and the bad and you get through it and you work through it. But people want that automatic Big Mac drive through solution for everything. It's not working. Well, let's move on to the next thing. And it sort of eased that statement. And I feel like, it was fun to bring something that's not scripted and pre-written, pre-existing in a box that, in you know, statements that people hear all day, all the time. And that's fun. I think that's fun in comedy as well as to have someone go, well, look, um, do I have, like, I talk about this too. I'm like, do we have to like now champion everybody who wants to be, uh, what, you know, who, who has a certain, who like thinks of themselves in this way or that way and wants a pat on the back. I was like, you know, we've lost the art of tolerance. You know, can't I just tolerate you <laughs> instead of be happy about who you are? <laughs> like, tolerating was great. <laughs> Back in the day, when it was like, let's be more tolerant, you know? Yeah. Not more like... So, I felt like bringing that point of view on stage was fun. People were like, yeah, that's kind of funny. It's like, I don't have to champion everybody who says that they, they feel a certain way, you know? Yeah, I also miss the days when I could reserve the right to be wrong, you know? Without getting some sort of backlash. Yeah. And I, I'm also glad not to be tied to anybody corporately wh who would say, well, you know, you really shouldn't express that opinion based on blah, blah. Why can't I just express the opinion and own it? When do you own my opinion? Yeah. You know, just because I happen to work for you. Yeah. Doesn't mean that the opinion has anything to do with you. Well, you know, we could lose some advertisers over that. I go, well, that's a bad relationship you got with your advertiser. You set that up, not me. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's, it's like the equivalent of everybody going, well, today you can, from now on. You can only wear gray. That's all you can wear. You're not allowed to wear blue or red because those colors affirm too much. There are colors you com you're committed to an opinion here. You're committing to a color, a real color. You can't say blue. You can't say red. So that's what it is. It's like people are afraid to express a real opinion, like a strong opinion and go, look, this is what I feel. And I'm not backtracking on this because today you got to go, well, let's think about the situation a little bit and let's evaluate it. And you're basically saying nothing. Yeah. And someone's getting a check for coming up with those words and stalling. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. How do we say something without saying anything? You know, that's yeah. basically it. Uh, what's the future hold for you in the next six months to a year? Um, well, touring Canada, starting now in Winnipeg, going coast to coast. You're starting in Winnipeg? Uh, starting in Winnipeg. This starts here? It starts here. So this is going to be the... You, I'm going to see the first show. Yeah, exactly. You're going to see the first show. Holy crap. Yeah. I feel like, you know... I, no, the worst part is I paid money for it. It's great. The first show is always the most exciting. <laughs> That's where the mistakes happen. Uh, okay. That's where people go, I can't believe you just said that. I would have come to night three. <laughs> night three? Night three. By then, I'll have, have filtered out oh. stuff that's too controversial where okay. people can't handle. So I do want to come for the first you show. I want to come for the first one where everybody gets mad and there's a oh, riot. This is going to be awesome. Outside, yeah, because the first one is where I put everything out and then I see where the Canadian sensibilities are and go, okay, this got awkward. Now we're going to have to move this around. We'll see what happens with this. Okay, the LGBTQ community is going to come and parade outside my house. <laughs> you know, so I, I, no, so I have to like really kind of, you know, uh, nuance everything and, and feel it. But the first night is where I really go gung ho. So. That's going to be good. I'm going to be there. I'll yeah. be front and center for it. Yeah, the first and probably the late shows even like the late shows are usually. Um, well, you have the sensibility to turn it up a little bit at night. Yeah. And not just that the late show, you have more time because there's no second show after. Right. You know, so you're able to to, to kind of go longer as well. Um, so uh, Canadian tour up until mid-October 
and then uh, France, uh, everything but Paris. Uh, then uh, during that tour, in the middle of that tour, I'm doing the semifinals and the finals of France's uh, France's Got Talent. I'm one of the judges. I'm the Simon yeah. Cowell of France. I got that uh, left chair. And then um, American tour beginning of 2020. Paris, a big run in Paris again. Mega big theaters in uh, March 2020. And then that's it. Continuing, uh, you know, Canada, France, uh, the UK. So it's uh, all up on my website, sugarsammy.com. Great. Do you have a, so the American dates are up there too? American dates aren't up there yet. We're still working them out, but they're going to be there. Okay. Because, you know, Minneapolis is just seven hours south of here, right? Minneapolis. It, is Paisley Park now available for us to yeah. visit? Is it like the Graceland? It's very, yeah. It's, it's as advertised. You need to go. Uh, I'd love to go. Yeah. I'd love to go. I'd love to go see what happened. Uh, how, what the vault looks like. I want to yeah. know what's in the vault. You will you will especially love Minneapolis. I've been there many times now, just you know, from the proximity of Winnipeg. I know it's seven hours south, but I go down there a couple times a year, and it's it's become one of my favorite cities in America. Okay, well, I got to go. I have been there. I've headlined a, cl- a comedy club there. Um, uh, Rick Bronson, who has comedy clubs in Edmonton and in Phoenix, he has a comedy club out there. I headlined it 10 years ago. The House of Comedy in the Big Mall of America. Oh, there's one there too. Yeah, it's the biggest mall in North America, isn't it? Correct, it is. Yeah. Uh, The Gurmesians, I think, built that one as well. They did the one in Edmonton. Yeah. And um, I lived in Edmonton for many years, and I I knew Ricky when he was in Edmonton. Yeah, Um, that's cool. I like Ricky. I I see him every Just for Last now. And I haven't... It's funny, because I saw Ricky Bronson. I saw that that, uh, facade of his uh, in Arizona. I think it's in the Scottsdale portion. Okay. It's like right on the border of Scottsdale and Phoenix up there in Deer Ridge. And I'm, I'm fascinated by it to go check out a couple of shows. I go down to Phoenix once a year because you know i'm in winnipeg right i, I need to get out of of, yeah. of this bullshit and get down to man you gotta you gotta go see other things i know yeah but hang with the old people down in arizona i know but it's good to come back to the countryside too you know yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well it's funny i tra- i do travel quite a bit I, i'm sorry that our travels just haven't sort of intersected i know um but now that you're on tour in the states i'll make sure that it happens i'll come see you in in one of your spots because it's a great excuse for me to get out and come see you yeah just then text me anytime and let me know if you see something that interests you and uh you know you always got the vip treatment plus 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 oh absolutely hey check this out Peoria, Dayton. <laughs> uh, these are just places I'm not coming to see you. Yeah, and these are places I'm not going to, so it's perfect. It works out great, Matt. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming by, man. I, it's so good. It's been nearly 10 years, I figure, so I'd give you a big hug, but we're separated by at least five feet and some microphone cable. Okay, we'll do it off air. <laughs> the Hot Air Podcast. For more, including show notes and links, go to hotairpodcast.com and wherever great social media is found. A production of the Sound Off Media Company.